The Day of the Rope by Devin Stack Chapter 11 They were losing control Despite having to stay out of the public eye And after losing the election The election he had managed against a so-called long-shot candidate Despite the donors that had all turned tail and ran from him since the election. Brad Valentini still had some influence. He could plant stories and book guests on news networks that would push his narrative. But this isn't what it was supposed to be like. They were supposed to be doing a victory lap right now. This was going to be the final phase of a plan that had been in motion for a century, if not longer. He wouldn't allow it to end like this, no matter what the others were saying. Brad felt robbed. For his entire life, he had been the errand boy for the kings and queens. If they had a problem, he made it go away. And they had handed him some pretty monumental problems over the years. Some of those problems had been people. People were easy to make disappear. The law enforcement in this country was on a leash and rolled over whenever they were told. And the press was eager to please. Even now, with the election over and lost, it hadn't changed. They knew they had as much to lose, if not more, if things kept going in the direction they seemed to be going. That's why what had been happening had been so perplexing it was now his people who were disappearing he'd talked to his men at the FBI the CIA the DOJ and every other relevant agency under his employer's thumbs and nobody had a clue he'd come to the realization that after being on the offense for all these years the decades they had spent to repurpose these so-called investigative agencies as more of a security force that protected their interests and occasionally shut down competitors. They had gone for so long without any opposition that they had lost the ability to perform their publicly stated function investigating. Who was it that had said security breeds incompetence? He thought of it like a pizza parlor. Front that was set up to launder money. For decades it laundered money without a hitch. But then, once the money had dried up, the pizza parlor was expected to actually make pizza and make it well enough to turn a profit. That was bad enough. What was worse, he didn't think that all these senseless tragedies, in quote, were coming from the current administration, as some of its colleagues had been assuming. There just wasn't any infrastructure for these kinds of operations that would allow them to take place outside of his earshot. Something this big couldn't possibly evade his people, and something about it just seemed kind of chaotic and random. If the opposition was taking people out, there didn't seem to be any strategy to it. 
Additionally, the manner in which some of his former colleagues were meeting their ends seemed a little too theatrical. To be the work of the kind of professional hit teams that this opposition would be using. Mel Cohen been found hanging from a chandelier with his genitals shot off. Shot off. He had seen the photos. Brad still couldn't figure out how they got Mel's fat ass up there. Figuring it was better to be safe than sorry. They had retaliated. It was still a remote possibility, however unlikely, that the administration had grown too bold. A new senator who was starting to be a nuisance was tragically shot in front of his office in D.C. The press, of course, had blamed it on crazed lone gunmen and then immediately started pushing for gun control. This was always very effective on the cattle and more important now than it had ever been. This sort of thing would spook inept representatives of the opposition that might be emboldened by their recent election win and try to upset the order of things. It would also give controlled oppositions an excuse to act feckless and blend in with those whose incompetence wasn't an act. Brad was operating in a state of perpetual extreme measures. People who were untouchable were dropping dead on a weekly basis. He was starting to make the people he worked for panic. This was an unusual circumstance, and in some ways, it was unnerving. These people were the kind of people who were who they were precisely because they didn't panic. They were cold and calculating, just like him. With any luck, these unfamiliar emotions might, might make him one of them. Sloppy. He would be ready to take advantage of any slip-ups they might make. Errors in strategy created opportunities for him. But he was uncomfortable with the abundance of opportunities he was given. Brad's phone buzzed. Someone had sent him an encrypted text. Since all the recent data breaches, they had been forced to move to more secure systems. He hated all the steps that they were now required to use to unlock his phone and access his messages. After verifying his identity, he opened the new message. The message was from his assistant, Rory. It was a link to an Arlington Times article. Right after the link, Rory, Rory had simply typed the word, Fuck. This couldn't be good. Brad couldn't remember the last time someone had sent him good news. He opened the link and began to read the article. As he read it, he felt the tightness in his chest. By the time he had finished the article, it was like he was being pressed between the thumb and forefinger of some giant toddler that didn't know its own strength. The story was about the murder of a former colleague of his, Randy Bishop. Randy had been fired from the campaign when he had been caught with child porn on his computer. Of course, they didn't fire him for having giddy porn. They fired him for being stupid and getting caught with kitty porn. 
That had taken up the news cycle with accusations of pedophilia for about 48 hours until his friends in the media could shut it down. That was one subject that, at least for now, still outraged the cattle. But they would accept that too, eventually. As for now, if the cattle really knew what went on at the parties that Brad and these media people went to, they would have strung them all up and hung them all from the Ellington Bridge. Law enforcement wasn't exactly innocent either, which is why it was so stupid that Randy had been caught. He'd been picked up in a sting run by some uppity local cop trying to fuck an 11 year old that had turned out to be a cop. What made this so infuriating was if Randy had wanted 11 year old pussy, he could have had it. Hell, Brad had arranged for them to have younger than that on several occasions in the past, but no. Randy wanted the thrill of the hunt, and he had fucked them all over. Well, for 48 hours. Sure, the rumors on the internet persisted to this day, and this story wasn't going to help anything, but the media had done their jobs when the story had first broke, insisting it was all a conspiracy theory. They would merely have to do it again. In fact, this time the story wouldn't reach a single corporate media outlet. He would make sure of that. It still gave the alternative media personalities on the internet more ammunition. His bosses didn't fully understand the impact that was having. According to the article, Randy had once again been chasing after young girls. But this time it wasn't the cops that got him. Apparently, Randy and six others whose names he didn't recognize were lured to a home of a man named Marcus Taylor. Initially, the police had thought that Mr. Taylor had operated his own kind of sting operation. It appeared that Taylor was was posing as young girls online and then inviting the men to his home to promise them sex. One by one, he had executed the men who showed up until someone had called in an anonymous tip claiming that there had been a murder. When the police arrived at the scene, they searched Taylor's home and found the bodies of the men stacked neatly in a bedroom. However, Taylor was no longer a suspect. Upon further investigation, they had found his body in the basement freezer. The police now suspected the unknown person who had called in the tip had run this rogue operation themselves. Marcus Taylor had been on the sex offender registry for kidnapping and raping a couple of kids back in the 90s. The current theory was that some vigilante had killed him first and then used his home his internet accounts to get Randy and the others. What the fuck was happening? There was no way this was organic. He had doubted that the administration had been behind the recent assassinations. But things were getting scary. There needed to be some high-level discussions to figure this out. 
he would have to coordinate a conference between his people and the various agencies and his bosses. Randy was expendable and no significant and no significant loss to cause, but there was an unspoken rule about who was fair game, and it had been violated too many times now. Maybe the opposition really did want a war. That was impossible. Both sides needed the status quo. That's what was so perplexing about this escalation. The public had always watched the political theater and had imagined what they saw was real. The gullible voting public believed the fiction. There was a never-ending battle raging between the left and the right. Indeed, there were power struggles within the establishment. But they were two sides of the same coin. One of the sides of the coin was always going to be on top at any given moment. But to destroy one side was to destroy the coin. That's what didn't make sense. Sure, there were new faces right now. More than usual. The elections had also culled a large number of the establishment. But most of the new blood was already bought and paid for. It just didn't make any damn sense. Hands where I can see him, a voice shouted. Brad suddenly became acutely aware of his surroundings. He'd been so lost in thought that he'd almost forgotten where he was. He stood frozen in the middle of his spotless designer kitchen. This was his private home in the Chevy Chase that he had recently operated out of. This was his private. Oh, sorry. Uh, this was his private home in Chevy Chase that he had secretly operated out of from time to time. It was the properly he property he considered the most secure. Nobody outside his closest of circles even knew that he owned the house. He had purchased it using several shell corporations and an anonymous LLC registered in New Mexico. The only people that knew about this house were also people that knew about the seekers that it held. That's what terrified Brad most. He hoped this was just a burglar that had happened upon him by pure chance. Because if it wasn't... Hands where I can see him. The voice shouted again. This time, it managed to be more menacing. Who? Brad began to turn to his assailant. Look at the fucking wall. Hands where I can see them or so help me I will drop you here right now. The voice shouted. Brad's face darkened. Whoever this was he doubted they were law enforcement. And quite frankly he had picked the wrong time to fuck with him. He turned on his heel and was met with a bright flash, followed by a loud popping sound that took him by surprise. His right arm had flung back violently for some unfathomable reason, and he almost lost his balance. What the fuck? Brian began another flash, followed by another pop, spun him around and sent him face down to the cold tile floor. Gasping for air, Brad fumbled about on his stomach. He tried to push himself up off the floor, 
and that's why you noticed his hand. Brad let out a shriek that sounded like nothing he had ever uttered before. He wasn't even sure if the sound had come from him. Nothing seemed real. After seeing the mangled, f massive flesh where his hand had once been. What did you do to my fucking hand? Brad screamed. You know, I was hoping this would go down differently. Not that I wanted to take my time, although that seems like the right thing to do, considering it's you. I had this weird scenario in my head where I'd threaten you, maybe hurt you a little bit, and make you confess to every last thing you'd done. Maybe... You'd have some kind of insurance file that you'd try to bargain with or something like that. But once I saw you, I stopped caring about all that, Ethan said. Stepping out of the hallway where you'd been standing into the dimly lit designer kitchen. He was aiming a large revolver at Brad, and his face remarkably relaxed and passionless. He looked like what indifference would look like if it was pointing a forty-five at your head. Who the fuck are you? What are you going to do? What the fuck? Brad said, gasping for air, still face down the floor, but feebly trying to look over his shoulder at Ethan. You know, you're way smaller in real life. All of you people are, Ethan said. Brad was small for a man with such an imposing presence. He clocked in at about five foot and two inches. Most people were often surprised when they first met him in person, though they dare not express it. He knew what they were thinking when they saw their eye when he saw their eyebrows lift ever so slightly upon meeting him face to face for the first time. And each time it aggravated him. All the same, he knew it was another one of his assets. It caused people to us underestimate him. This mistake had been made by many, and many had paid dearly for that mistake. You don't know what you just did, Brad screamed into the blood pooling on the floor by his face so loud it rippled. I, I don't know what I just did. That sounds like a threat, Brad. You're in no condition to be making threats. Get up, Ethan said coldly. Brad managed to push himself up into a sitting position while cradling his injured right hand. He'd also been shot somewhere in the torso, but the shock he was experiencing made it difficult for him to localize the pain. He looked at Ethan and was surprised at what he saw. An unassuming young man maybe in his thirties, wearing, wearing what appeared to be the kind of cheap suit worn by interns on the hill when they first moved into Washington. In fact, Ethan looked just like one of the many faceless, suit-wearing, clean-shaven young men who blended into the scenery of Washington. The only difference was these cookie-cutter congressional aides usually weren't pointing a gun at him 
did he know this man? Listen to me. You fucked up. You fucked up bad, and you know it. Brad said, coughing up blood. But you can still get out of this. It's all out of your system now, yeah? So why don't you fuck off before the Secret Service or my private security... You don't have Secret Service protection anymore, Brad. You don't have any protection. You think I don't know how soundproof this place is? Ethan fired a shot into the floor between Brad's legs and smiled a quiet smile as Brad began to scream again. You think I don't know what goes on down there? Brad was still screaming as Ethan pointed to the floor with his gun. Shut up, Brad. I'm talking. You think I don't know what you do down there? Ethan's eyes were dark and piercing. Listen, listen, listen. Just listen. No, you listen, Brad. Ethan pressed the smoldering hot barrel of his gun against Brad's temple. It radiated so much heat it singed Brad's eyebrow. The smell of burnt hair was overpowered by the strong odor of gunpowder, blood, and urine that already filled the room. You listen to me, Ethan said. Ethan reached down with his free hand and picked Brad's phone up off the floor, then pointed the camera at the dying man. You're going to tell me exactly everything you know, and I mean everything. Ethan hissed.